and to everyone for coming today for our topic, which is Women in Islam, part of our Discover Islam series. Uh, today we have the honor of having um, someone who has spoken throughout the country regarding this topic, but today hopefully she can uh, enlighten us slightly more on this topic. Sometimes, which can be confusing for many, sometimes where many people have different questions regarding it, and hopefully she can speak more in depth today. A uh, little descri uh, description into uh, Sister Zara Faris, who will be talking for us today. She's a graduate of SOAS, um, graduating in Arabic and Islamic studies, having spent time, of course, uh, studying in Egypt, studying Arabic and other Islamic studies. Um, currently, she's a researcher and speaker for the Muslim Debate Initiative, and she has delivered lectures all across the UK um, on the subjects of women's rights in Islam, the role of women in Islam, the concept of hijab, and the four greatest women of, um, of Islam, and also spoken at numerous community centers. That's um, hopefully a slight brief introduction, but more importantly, we find out with her words what she has to say, inshallah, on the topic. Um, Sister Zara Faris. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Assalamu alaikum and greetings and thank you all for coming and thank you to the ISOC for inviting me back to SOAS today to speak with you about the topic of women in Islam and I understand that initially there were going to be two speakers so one speaker was going to speak about some of the misconceptions about women in Islam and I was going to speak about sort of Islam and its relationship with feminism but uh, due to certain circumstances, we now only have myself, so I'm going to try to do a little bit of both, and I'm going to try and keep it, um, not double the length, but you know, I'm going to try and keep it to, to around 30 minutes, hopefully. Um, so, over the last year, or even decade, we've heard numerous claims um, targeted at Muslim women, claiming that Muslim women are oppressed. And such claims have largely come from the feminist quarters of societies, often citing things like equality, freedom, and empowerment. The reality, however, is that human beings in today's world are pretty much uh, oppressed all over, regardless of faith or where they live. Consider the example of the Tunisian Muslim man, Mohammed Bouaziz, who set himself on fire, effectively igniting the Arab Spring. Now, why did he do that? He was frustrated because of the unemployment, the tyranny, and the unjust rule in his land. And he wasn't alone. He was one of hundreds of thousands of Tunisian, Algerian, and Egyptian men who were facing similar problems of tyrannical leadership and unemployment. And all they wanted to do was to be able to provide for their families with dignity. But this wasn't raised as, you know, men are oppressed in Islam question. Yet when the topic is raised for women, it's always the same again. Why are Muslim women oppressed? So while there's wholesale oppression, you know, worldwide, it's quite flattering that Muslims are held to a higher, you know, standard when it comes to women and we're constantly asked to justify what's happening with the Muslim women. In reality, complaining that Muslim women specifically are oppressed, you know, it's like saying that the house is not in order when in fact the entire house is burning down and we're all on the street. And I'll discuss, you know, it's the very same narrative that says, you know, uh, that focuses only on women at the expense of the rest of society that causes these problems in the first place. So let's consider, I'm going to consider three examples. First, um, the issue of, and they're all pretty contemporary, so you might know a little bit about what's been happening um, in London or in the UK with them recently. The first is segregation, the second is the discussion of gender roles, and the third is the discussion, the never-ending discussion of the niqab and the veil in general. So let's consider the recent claims that were made against the Muslim community on the grounds of gender segregation. So recently, Muslims were under fire for allowing students to self-segregate at a public event at a university. It was an educational event. The audience were allowed to sit where they wanted, and women naturally tended to sit in one area, and men tended to sit in another area. And yet, uh, Muslims were told with a straight face that this is a gross <coughs> inequality, and it's an oppression on women to voluntarily segregate at public events. <coughs> And this should be officially regulated against, and universities are looking into how to police segregation at university events. And Muslims were told that this practice is against British culture. There was an article in The Telegraph which published the following. It said, requesting that women in a public place sit separately away from men is entirely alien to 21st century British culture. 
Now, this is not only completely hypocritical, given that in this country, we already have boys-only schools, we already have girls-only schools, we have Eton, of which there is no female equivalent, we have segregated Girl Scouts, uh, Girl Guides and Boy Scouts, we have segregated PE classes, we have segregation in many aspects of our society. And yet when Muslims do it, suddenly, you know, it's, it's alien to 21st century British culture. And not only that, but saying that it's, you know, um, oppressive to voluntarily segregate is like saying that if I choose to sit with a woman rather than a man, I'm somehow lowering myself. I mean, that kind of says more about, you know, the, criti you know, the critique's um, impression of women than it does of Muslims' impression of women. The second example is uh, that of gender roles. And this is where we can start to see the introduction of the idea that is peddled often by uh, feminists that Muslim men are misogynists and Muslim women are either brainwashed or they're complicit in their own oppression or the suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. So take the claims against Muslim women. You know, some Muslim women, they don't want to be the next, you know, they don't want to win a Nobel Prize. They don't want to be CEOs. Some Muslim women don't want to be the next Miley Cyrus. Some Muslim women just want to serve their creator by being, you know, good wives and mothers, as do many women. But when Muslim women do this, we're told that being a wife or a mother is not a worthy aspiration. We're told that it's a disservice to your full potential. How dare anyone tie a woman's worth to a man? This rather sexist claim, which tends to originate in liberal, you know, from liberal feminists, is made because they don't believe that women should be defined in relation to men. Firstly, this is kind of ironic given that the whole of feminism is about how women define themselves in relation to men. How much do men earn? What jobs do men do? What power does men have? And this is, you know, feminists are constantly defining themselves in accordance to men. But if that doesn't shock feminists, what really shocks them is not the fact that those women who choose to be wives and mothers, they don't do it for men. They don't do it to empower men. They don't even do it to empower themselves, but rather they do it because they believe in a certain way of life and they believe in certain values which hold those things, being a good wife and being a good mother, it holds them dear. Not only that, but is it really misogynistic to want to be a good wife or mother? In Islam, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, he said to men, he said that men's virtue would be judged in relation to their wives. He said to Muslim men, the best amongst you are those who are best to their wives. So if for over 1400 years it hasn't been, you know, uh, misogynistic or misandric for men to want to be good wives, why, uh, husbands, why is it suddenly, you know, misogynistic for women to want to be good wives? And now this is the main example and this is going to follow through and kind of try to explain um, the underlying thinking behind these claims against Muslim women and this is the big one. And this is the debate over the Muslim face veil, the niqab. And the niqab, by extension, the arguments which are made against it could also be applied to the hijab, i.e. the head covering or other concepts of Islamic modesty. But I'm going to go with the niqab because this is the one which has been picked up recently and there's going to be a bill being passed to try and get a ban of the niqab in England. And till today, the debate has been mostly academic, with so few women that actually wear the niqab in Britain Instigating a national debate on them is like hunting mosquitoes with nuclear weapons. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Monty Python, but there's an episode in which they decide to go hunting and they're hunting for mosquitoes and they use huge cannons and huge bazookas and all kinds of nuclear weapons just to try and find these little things. And it's very much the same, the issue with the niqab. So the idea that the niqab ought to be banned from the public was, you know, nevertheless planted earlier this year, and it's since been manured with different reasons, read excuses, um, for why this should be, um, or why the, a ban should be pursued, or at the very least, why society sh should strongly, you know, discourage the niqab, i.e. bully it out of society. And newspapers, once again, they published titles like the following. They said, civilized society must not draw a veil over the niqab, as if to suggest that Muslims were not <laughs> civilized. Now, the topic of objectification needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you some statistics anyway. So a study conducted by Harvard and LSE showed that almost two-thirds of women thought that society expects women to enhance their physical attractiveness and that women who are more beautiful have greater opportunities in life. And more than half of women 
thought that physically attractive women are more valued by men. In essence, it found that women see beauty and physical attractiveness as increasingly socially mandated and rewarded. And not only this, but further research found that six out of 10 girls stopped doing things they love because they felt bad about how they looked. Six out of 10 girls felt restricted in their lives. They didn't want to go out, they wouldn't go to school, they wouldn't go to the doctor because they felt bad about how they looked. Recently, animal biologists also did experiments and they found that creatures could be made more responsive to exaggerated stimuli, of visual stimuli, even if it was artificial, to the point that they would neglect a natural visual stimuli. So for example, they did an experiment where they, um, they, found, they basically experimented with birds' nests. So where they, uh, uh, the mother bird had recently laid eggs and they had hatched the, and their mother bird would go away to find food to feed these birds. What they did was they went to these nests and they added a fake bird to the nest. And the fake bird would be a stronger color of blue to all the natural birds. It would be much bigger than the other birds. It would have a wider and brighter beak than the other birds. And they wanted to see how the mother bird would react when it came back, or the, the father bird, or whichever bird was feeding it. They wanted to see how it would react when it came back to the nest and saw this very exaggerated and almost you know, bizarre looking thing, but which was basically a form of exaggerated stimuli of what the bird would naturally see. And the bird that was feeding the others basically only fed the fake bird. It only fed the bird that had all this exaggerated um, uh, features, and it completely ignored it's the actual living, you know, natural birds. And we see this in society with objectification of women. We see that often um, men, or sometimes even women, are now gravitating towards what is exaggerated and what is unnatural and neglecting that which is natural and normal. A number of talks I've done at different universities, some um, uh, girls have come up to me afterwards, including Muslim women, and said, um, you know, uh, we, wear the, we wear the hijab and we cover up. But we noticed that um, you know the brothers they just don't give us the time of day, and they go to you know they, they veer towards those who are who are not covered and who are exaggerated in their appearance and things like this. And you know, for in terms of achieving the concept of hijab, like as in you know modesty in society, it's something that both brothers and sisters have to do. But we can see that what was happening with the bird is happening in society today. The other day I was um I was recently on the tube, and you know everybody knows the sun, right? Everybody knows page three. Does anybody not know page three? Okay, so just in case, um, on page three, every, you know, it's a traditional newspaper in this country, The Sun, and page three has always a nude picture of a woman. And um, the other day I was on a tube and I saw a man, it was pretty packed so I was standing, and he was reading The Sun, and you know, first page, turn over, and then he just stopped, and he lingered on that page for about 10 minutes. And you know, he was surrounded by women, you know, because there were many people on the tube. Not only that, but you know, there's a woman sitting right next to him, and I, it just in my head, just strangely, I thought, oh gosh, imagine if that was his wife, how terrible she would feel. And do you know, it turned out that that was his wife. So she was sitting next to her husband in public while he was looking at this page for a very long time. And it's the same thing, you know, looking at these exaggerated forms of, you know, what is supposed to be beauty and neglecting what is natural and what should be legitimately and, and rightfully kind of pursued, um, you, know, in the, you know, in a code that is, you know, uh, agreed upon. And, you know, human beings are supposed to be better than animals, but we're seeing that these days it's becoming difficult to kind of make that um, distinction. And for Muslims, covering up is a passport to participate fully in public life, essentially, with minimum distraction for both men and for women. Because Islam recognizes that not covering up is both a distraction, not only for women, but for men. It's the same. It's supposed to do them both a favor. And it's interesting to note that the etymology, the origin of the root um, of the word niqab, um, is, uh, actually means to perforate, to make a hole, or to excavate, or to travel through a place. Um, and for many women who wear the niqab or even the hijab, it often feels like that. It feels like you are being able to travel through you know, a place comfortably. Um, you know, you've made your little space and you can do that without fear of kind of you know, harassment or this kind of thing. Um, this is what the niqab or the hijab enables many women to do. Now for feminists, however, the idea that a woman should practice modesty is in itself affirmation of a patriarch, i.e. men telling her what she should or should not do. Of course, for feminists, such rights should only be reserved for themselves. 
Now, when Amina Tyler, does anybody uh, did anybody hear of Amina Tyler, the Tunisian um, uh, woman who joined Femen and basically did a topless protest? So there's the, there's the, there's a nutshell. Um, a, a woman, a Tunisian woman called Amina Tyler, she joined Femen, which is a Ukrainian feminist group that likes to raise awareness about issues by doing topless protests. So Amina Tyler, from a Muslim country, from a Muslim family, decided that she wanted to do a similar such protest. And she did a similar protest. She posted pictures of herself nude on the internet saying, my, with a writing over her body saying, my body is mine and not the source of anyone's honor. And she was supported by feminists because she was upholding one of the underlying fundamental values of feminism, which is the idea of ownership over one's body and reinforcing feminist drive for autonomy. Let me explain what I mean by that. Now, feminists have long complained that the female has been regarded as being enmeshed in her bodily existence. I'm sorry if this gets slightly abstract, but it won't be abstract for very long, I promise. <coughs> so they argue that um, women are basically enmeshed in their bodily existence in a way that makes the um, attainment of rationality questionable. In other words, they argue that women, unlike men, are perceived as being bodies instead of human beings having bodies. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm getting some nods, okay. And they call this enmeshment or embodiment. And according to feminists, to explain, they say women are somehow more biological, more corporeal, and more natural than men. In other words, I am not my body, I own my body. So this is the feminist you know, um, uh, thinking behind this, that for them it means that they can do whatever they like with their bodies without any consequence or consideration for other people in society. But how exactly do any of us Women or men own our bodies. If ownership is control, then neither men nor women own their bodies. Did we give birth to ourselves? Can we will against aging or sickness? If ownership is maintenance, can we survive without depending on other bodies or on the environment for our continued existence? So Islam recognizes that we do not own our bodies and therefore we do not have complete autonomy over what we do with them. We instead, Islam considers that instead we are entrusted with our bodies and we have duties towards each other based on that. Now, whilst feminists are annoyed that women are not seen as rational beings, so I just explained how feminists were annoyed that women aren't seen as rational, they're just seen as bodies. The irony is that they apply the exact same prejudice against Muslim women. When they say Muslim women who choose to wear the niqab or who choose to segregate or who choose to do certain roles must be brainwashed. They must be blindly following their cultures which are formulated by men according to them. So they peddle this narrative that reduces Muslim men to savage oppressors and it reduces Muslim women to mindless and helpless victims and then they study us like subjects under orientalist labels. Now, the thing is, if bad things happen in Western societies, when I say Western, I mean liberal societies, societies that subscribe to the ideology of liberalism along with um, concepts of individualism, things like that, they're considered to, you know, if things happen in those societies, if something bad happens, it's considered to reflect the behavior of only a few deviants. It's not considered to be a reflection on the ideology of society overall. But on the other hand, if something bad happens amongst Muslims, then it's considered to be the fault of the entire belief system, not just that one Muslim. For example, you know, if Dave was seen throwing rubbish on the street in Manchester, people would say, oh, Dave is a bit of a litterbug. But, you know, if Ahmed the Muslim was seen throwing rubbish on the street anywhere, they'd say Muslims are filthy savages, you know? And if, you know, and, and okay, here's a real example. Uh, recently, we had um, the child grooming cases in Rochdale where the men were Asian, and suddenly people were saying, oh, you know, this is a, a cultural issue, you know, they have a cultural problem. Um, uh, Muslims and people of the, you know, Pakistan and Bangladeshi origin should look at their value systems. You know, they didn't say, oh, these men are deviants. But when the exact same thing happened, another story came out not long after amongst a non-Muslim community also in Britain. Nobody said, oh, this is about Western values. No, they just said, oh, these are some messed up guys here, here you know. So we have this double standard. Uh, we saw the same with uh, the uh, Egyptian uh, recently where all Egyptian men were reduced to animals and beasts uh, by the New York Post because um, one mob basically decided to very brutally uh, assault um, a female journalist. 
And the assumption is that uh, people of, um, of cultures or religions from the East are motivated only by culture, whereas Western people are only motivated by choice or rational thought. So non-Western people are assumed to be governed by cultural diktats, whereas the capacity to reason is considered to be only capable in the West. And this feminist way of thinking comes from, you know, this uh, very colonialist history in which basically the West constructed the East as this exotic, um, backward and less enlightened kind of world and in need of uh, imperialism to be rescued from their backwardness. And feminists uh, have also then applied the same concept to Muslim women, Muslim women being exotic, backward and less enlightened and in need of uh, you know, feminists uh, to, to rescue them from the niqab or the segregation or their life choices. Of course, you know, they are assisted by a number of native informants, so like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Mona El Tahawi, who, who very conveniently confirm you know, uh, that Muslim men hate women. And the thing is, also in history, we can see that Orientalism has hugely affected uh, religious women, uh, particularly Muslim women. For example, um, Lord Cromer, a British leader in Egypt, uh, he accused Egyptians of degrading women through veiling. He said, you know, this is degrading and they should be liberated. Uh, and he cited feminist values, even though at the same time in Britain, he was, you know, uh, against uh, the feminist movement in Britain at the time. And he, so he said, no, we, you know, we must unveil Egyptian women. And he attempted to show himself as, you know, liberating them. Uh, but at the same time, he also restricted them. Or he wasn't liberating them by unveiling them, of course. He thought he was. Um, but he not only did that, but he also uh, prevented or put an end to... Egyptians had a tradition of basically training women to be doctors. This was a, um, a very, you know, lively and ongoing tradition um, in Egypt. But he put an end to that. And he said, uh, he basically said, our women in England uh, are, you know, they're quite happy with male doctors. So you can you can just basically do the same. So whereas women were previously liberated, they had their you know they had their values, they had their way of life, they were covered, didn't hold them back. They were training to be doctors, all kinds of things. They were achieving um, uh, Islamic education, which at that time incorporated already things like science and maths and those um, c core subjects, which are now separately called secular education. I don't understand how that came about, but previously it was all considered as one. Um, but these narratives, the feminist narrative and the colonial narrative, was used to take these things away from Muslims, especially from Muslim women. British uh, feminist suffragettes also used the image, they used the image of uh, the victimized sisters of India to basically say, oh, we don't want to be like them, and try to use this to say, we want to be liberated and, and basically have citizenship in, you know, in Britain because we don't want to be like the oppressed Indian women. And uh, Wollstonecraft did exactly the same. So Wollstone, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote the very seminal book which initiated or is considered to be you know, foundational in, uh, in British fem or in English feminism. And in that book, in the introduction, she wrote, we don't want to be like the, the Mohammedan women, i.e. the Muslim women. And this is despite the fact that at the time that she wrote the book, just across the, across the waters in the Ottoman Empire, Muslim women had it so good that even non-Muslim women wanted to live like them. I'll give you an example. In the Ottoman Empire, they had um, different, uh, basically, they, had, uh, they dealt with pluralism a lot better than we do in England today. So they would um, have uh, an, overarching, an overarching legal system that basically, sorry, that basically dealt with the uh, communal laws, I guess, that everybody had to abide by regardless of religion, traffic laws, things like theft and, and you know murder, you know criminal law and civil law in that in that sense. But it also um, gave different minority communities the space to have their own legal systems and to have their own uh, structures of power. So you would have, for example, so you would have this overarching um, you know uh, Islamic legal system under which you would have uh, you know a, a Jewish quarters where Jews could live according to their own laws. They would appoint a leader um, uh, from them to liaise and negotiate contracts with the with the Islamic State, and they would be able to live uninterfered with. They wouldn't be forced to conform to this grand identity that everybody had to be. Like in you know in England, we're told to com we're told to conform to something called British identity, which no one can actually define anyway. They were allowed to live according to their values. Um, not just the Jewish quarters, there was then Christian quarters, Armenian quarters, and they flourished in their own trades, they flourished in their own uh, cultures, their own languages, their own foods. 
and they weren't forced to use, uh, for example, um, uh, resolve their disputes, their civil disputes in Islamic courts. They had access to all of their own. Despite that, many women from those non-Muslim quarters preferred to go to Islamic courts to resolve their disputes because Islamic courts were considered to be much more just to their, to their needs, to women's needs at the time. And this is at the same time that Mary Wollstonecraft was writing in Britain about how oppressed women were in Britain and how oppressed they were in the Ottoman, in the Ottoman Caliphate and that they didn't want to be anything like them. And it's the same ignorance that we have today when, uh, when people talk about um, how oppressive you know, Islam is and it's not actually the case. Now, the arguments being used um, in the attempt to guide the public towards a ban of the niqab, for example, are far from rational, to say the least. So they like to go on about you know, how feminism is rational and Muslims are irrational and blindly following whatever. But they're full of contradictions. I'm going to give you some examples. So, for example, niqab-wearing women are either classed as completely intimidating social citizens, but they're also really intimidated victims and in need of rescuing. And let's take a look at some of the schizophrenic claims that are made about women in the niqab. So, first of all, and do listen for the contradictions. The niqab is forced on women against their will, so these women must be forced to remove it. The niqab is a restriction on women's life choices, so women should be denied the choice to wear it. How's that for restriction? The niqab is both, this is my favourite one, the niqab is both demeaning to men, but it's also imposed by men. In other words, men impose the niqab to demean themselves. Okay. The niqab is a form of sexual objectification, so Muslim women must be forced to reveal their bodies just like everybody else. The niqab is antisocial, so let's ban it and confine these women to their homes, just like what happened in France. The niqab makes women invisible, and seeing them is really scary. The niqab inhibits communication, even if niqab-wearing women tell us otherwise, and even if you know surgeons who cover their faces when doing you know life-changing surgery, life-saving surgery, you know they communicate just fine with their faces covered. But when Muslim women want to do it, suddenly communication is inhibited. Now, do these views look like the results of rational thinking? Muslims are yet to be convinced. The reality is that feminist, feminism is basically a reactive ideology that itself blindly follows the irrational Western philosophy of individualism. Feminists claim to abhor following cultures defined by men, and yet they advocate terms like equality and individualism, which were coined by men anyway. So they are themselves are following cultures defined by men. At least in Islam, we follow cultures that are defined by our creator, not by men or women. And in any case, the use of uh, their euphemistic use of terms like equality, freedom, and empowerment are very different to the Islamic equivalents. In practice, we find that these Western concepts all actually contradict each other. Calling for equality, freedom, and empowerment is very much like calling out rock, paper, scissors, or ching chang wallow, if anybody ever called it that. Each intrinsically limits the other. For example, if everybody is equal in the eyes of the law, then empowering, i.e. giving one person an advantage, negates the equality overall. Equality constricts freedom by imposing uniformity. If everybody has the same, where is your freedom? And maintaining individual freedom denies the empowerment of other people over you. So, in fact, and I'm coming to the end now, let's consider, as a final step, the so-called feminist progress towards equality, freedom, and empowerment that they would have Muslim women emulate. On one hand, feminists demand that women's treatment should never be influenced or guided by their gender. But at the same time, they then cite biological factors when they argue that women, for example, with PMS, should have diminished legal responsibility, i.e. it should be a legal defense in crime. And so they should be less accountable when breaking the law. Not to mention, using that, um, they use the same argument um, in sexist campaigns to close down female prisons but not male prisons. They say that women have certain biological um, needs and conditions, which means that prison's just not so convenient for women, as if prison is convenient for men. Sexist quotas they also have to get women into jobs based on gender rather than merit. And they call these um, they call these expeditory measures. They say, oh, you know, we know it's kind of biased, but we won't do it for long. We'll just wait until things kind of even out between men and women. 
They also have, um, you know, the sexist lavishing of attention on female learning needs and neglecting male learning needs, so much so that now young men are considered to be a disadvantaged group when it comes to universities. University chiefs describe men now as a disadvantaged group, so how's that for equality? Um, there are indicators of positive correlations between, uh, and feminists have identified this themselves as well, between the rise of feminism and the rise of divorce, with women being uh, liberated from their marriages, I guess, and children being liberated from their parents, with some feminists even describing marriage as a patriarchal construct. Um, the suffragette use, when the suffragettes wanted to get the vote, they used what would in the modern day be considered terrorist activity, including letter bombs, property damage, bombs, yes I said bombs, letter bombs, property damage, and even injury to others just to get the chance to vote in a system that doesn't benefit anybody but the elite anyway. They also earn themselves the right to be taxed and become debt slaves to the modern capitalist state just like their fellow men, rather than using all that energy to actually challenge the economic system that's in place in the first place. And not to mention, finally, the resulting backlash from various men's rights movements that's also resulted. So as we can see, rather than fixing the oppression, feminists have simply reversed it. With a car crash record like that, why would Muslims, who have a perfectly defined and complete system, why would they want to emulate the extreme and confused culture that is being imposed upon us or being tried to impose upon us? or to yield to the irrational criticisms that we've heard today of our family structures or our dress code or any, or any of our values. You see, if Muslims are oppressed, it's not because of Islam, but because of the lack of Islam. But if people are oppressed in the West, for example, via objectification, it's not because of the lack of liberalism, but because of liberalism. And that is true oppression, when the ideology is working and the ideology oppresses you. With Islam, we don't have um, an Islamic state anywhere at the moment. We have secular Muslim countries. Pakistan is a secular country. Uh, Bang all these countries which people consider to be Muslim are actually secular countries. They just have a few strands of Islamic law, which is why we see the oppression that is there today. And, uh, I, you know, so... I would invite those who do subscribe to those liberal values that give rise to those issues to consider and challenge and to consider alternative ways. And I hope that you find answers or you're able to ask questions about Islam and find tranquility in those answers instead. Thank you so much for listening. Um, we'll open the floor for questions now, inshallah. So, question at the back. Thank you, first of all. I think you've brought some really interesting issues. However, I've, I'd like to ask two questions. And firstly, I'd just like to say that I found some of the terminology you use quite problematic. For example, you use the term feminist as if it's one entity. And a lot of the examples you provided were of extreme feminism. For example, with the feminist movement, a lot of feminists within the feminist movement disagree with them. So I find that really problematic. And so my first question to you is, do you think feminism has a place in Islam? Sorry, the, the first question is, do you, I think, feminism has a place Okay. And my second question is, you spoke a lot about the problems in the West, but you disregarded the fact that there's a lot of Muslim countries where oppression against Muslim women does happen. And it's not just by men, Muslim women repress other Muslim women, as, 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 as it happens in the West too. But I think this sort of us and them discourse is really unhelpful, it's really unproductive and it doesn't get anywhere. So what, like, well, my second question would be, is it Islam that oppresses women, or is it Muslims that oppress women? Okay, thanks. So there's two questions there. I think I already answered both of them, but I'll reiterate. So uh, the first question, do I think um, you know, there's room for feminism in Islam? I think from my lecture it's pretty obvious that my answer to that is no. Um, feminist, feminist, you said you disagreed with the fact that I referred to feminism as all being one entity. The problem with feminism is that it is so fractured and there are so many different types of feminism. Liberal feminism, communist femi feminism, Marxist feminism, equity feminism, uh, there's every kind of feminism. So Even, yeah, let me, let me answer your question first. So there are so many different types of feminism. Even feminists don't agree on what feminism is. 
So how is something that's so fractured and disunited, how does it propose to provide solutions for human problems? It's not possible, and this is the problem with feminism. Why do Muslim women in particular need something that's so confusing when we already have something that's comprehensive and very direct and clear? And uh, you know, you said I cited examples of extreme feminism. I unfortunately did not. Uh, firstly, I cited examples of the suffragettes, who are definitely not considered uh, radical feminists. They were considered, you know, there's even a statue of them. They're considered very mainstream and like the foundation of feminism. I cited the example of how feminists advocate that women should have, uh, you know, um, legal, you know, uh, a legal defence in the case of PMS, and that they should have uh, uh, women's prisons closed down. Unfortunately, that was not an extreme example. Fawcett Society, which is one of the oldest um, and mainstream feminist organisations in the UK, they're the ones that advocate this. Baroness Corston, um, a, you know, a barrister, she's the one who advocated and supported these movements. She wrote papers on it. I'm sorry, but they're not um, extreme. And it's nice sometimes we like to think, oh, you know, these are extreme forms and we can distance ourselves from it. But the reality is that feminism in all its colors is unhelpful to Muslims. When we see the track record that it brings about, what does it have to offer for us? What does, what does feminism have to offer us? Rather, we should say, what does Islam have to offer to women? Not what does feminism have to offer to us? The second question, you said that, you know, there's, um, uh, there's this, I was talking about things as though it's us and them and that there's oppression of uh, Muslim women uh, in Muslim countries. Yeah, there is oppression. I was just checking my notes and I don't think I denied that. Um, I actually said the Muslim countries that are where these problems are arising, they're not Islamic countries. So Islam does not oppress women. I gave an example of Islamic state where these rulings and Islamic laws and principles were implemented fully. And I explained how those women were definitely not oppressed so much so that even non-Muslim women wanted to live like them. The problems we have in Muslim countries today, and I understand why, I understand your angst and there's an angst amongst many Muslim sisters when they see Islam provides all these rights. We know about them, but why are they not implemented? And the reason they're not implemented is because we're not advocating for them. Rather, we're talking about feminism and all these things that doesn't actually know not only how to define our rights, but it doesn't even know what women, what justice should look like. For Muslims, we have guidance. We have, divine, we have a divine picture of what justice looks like, not just for women, but for the whole of society. So those uh, women and men in Muslim countries, I also cited the example of the, what was happening with the men in Tunisia that cited the Arab Spring in the first place, who were equally oppressed. The solution is not feminism. The solution is the comprehensive implementation of Islam. Get those Muslim governments to implement those in full, in comprehensive, you know, without just, not just sticking a band-aid on the problem. And then you'll see more, you know, you, you'll see the rights being fulfilled. For example, these days, if, uh, if a Muslim woman in a Muslim, a Muslim country, i.e. a secular country, just to emphasize, these countries that people cite as Muslim, as Islamic, they're secular countries. Some of the constitutions are basically exactly the same as the American constitution. They just stick in some, you know, bits from Islam just to do lip service. If, if there's a problem between a husband and a wife in those countries, or even in this country, say for example, what can the Muslim woman do? Say the, just as an example, there's, there's abuse both ways. Statistics show these days that um, uh, actual domestic violence is pretty much 50-50 between men and women. Women abuse men just as much as men abuse women. Let's just say, for example, because we hear about it more often, uh, let's just say in a, you know, in a Muslim country, the husband is abusive to his wife. What can the wife do? She'll go to, you know, maybe, um, you know, a Qadi who we don't, he doesn't really have the power to implement his rulings or to enforce his ruling, and she'll get like a dodgy kind of, you know, uh, conclusion, just kind of put up with it or whatever. In an Islamic state, she has the right to go to the state and say, my husband is abusing me and neglecting me, and the state will discipline him and force him to comply with his legal obligations as a husband. We don't have that recourse now. Rather, we're like wallowing around in these different concepts of how do we get rights. We already have the complete package. We just need to implement it in those countries. So um, no, feminism doesn't have any place in Islam. Uh, Yep, should we start at the back and come forward? Yeah. Do, do you mean then that the Islamic um, feminists are wrong, are not uh, good Muslims? I'm not saying they're not good Muslims, I'm not here to... And the discourse is based on the Quran. Pardon? Their discourse is based on the Quran. 
Well, yeah, a lot of things can be based on the Quran. You know, the Al Qaeda claim to be based on the Quran. It doesn't mean you know they're actually based on the Quran. Are feminists? Uh, is there any feminists uh, with the Al Qaeda? No, they are modernists. They're all modernists. They all take a modernist interpretation of Islam, whether it's feminist or whether it's Al Qaeda. They're not traditional um, in their interpretations. Um, so your question was, uh, do I consider Islamic feminists to be not good Muslims? No, I didn't say anything about anybody being a good or a bad Muslim. I'm saying that I think that Muslim women would spend their time better if they focused on the Islamic more and less on the feminism side. I ask again, what has feminism done for Muslim women? Anything. Yeah. Uh, you said that we shouldn't ask uh, what feminism can offer us as Muslims, rather we should ask what Islam can offer us as Muslim women. But then if we ask the second question and say what Islam can offer us as uh, Muslim women in societies, it means that we're talking basically about women's rights in Islam. No, not necessarily. About justice, about justice, about equality in Islam in a very traditional sense, okay? And what that, that ha it has to be implemented in societies because it's not implemented nowadays in, in whatever country it was. That specifically, described that way, is called Islamic feminism. Why? Because Islamic feminists, they take this as an approach. When they add feminist as an adjective to whatever they're describing, they mean um, Muslim rights. They mean Muslim women's rights, not necessarily taking everything that the West said. But this just confirms something. This confirms that Islamic feminists think that Islam is not already about universal rights. It, com it implies that Islamic feminists think something is lacking, I have to add feminism on it. Islam, as you already know, which you've identified, is universalistic in its approach to justice. Yeah, I'm wondering that it's, it's lacking. They're not saying their discourse specifically is not mentioning that it's lacking. They're saying that it's not implemented. The exact thing that you're saying. It's not implemented. We want to implement it. We want to raise our voices, okay, in an Islamic sense, from an Islamic tradition. Because it is not implemented, therefore we are calling for it to be implemented. Therefore, this is called Islamic feminism. If that is, the defin if that is what Islamic feminists are saying, then they, they should just call themselves Muslims. Why, do, why don't I call myself an Islamic anti-racist or an Islamic you know, uh, econom you know, economist? Islam is comprehensive. You don't need to attach not only labels which are, you know, actually don't have good effects, but it's like saying, you know, I know, I know what you mean. It's like when, no, it's not, unfortunately, it's not just a terminology because it's connected with so much damage that has been done to Muslim women throughout history. I've given some examples today. Okay, do you know what this is like? I know some feminists say, and I think Tariq Ramadan also said recently in a, in a conference, he said, Feminism can mean whatever I want it to mean. It can mean whatever I define it to mean. This reminds me of when feminists wanted to reclaim the word slut and they traipsed through the streets and said, oh, this is a negative word, we want to reclaim it. We can define it how we want. That didn't work so well. And it's the same when feminists want to say, let's take... Pardon? We're not talking about the West. We're talking can about the Middle East. Please define feminist. Please define feminist. Exactly. Can any feminist please define feminist? This is my question. <laughs> You, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, next question. Oh, yeah. Did, did you still have Yeah, I wanted to know. We'll come back to you straight. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, you said that, uh, you know, I wanted to know if um, feminism can't provide a solution, what does Islam provide uh, women? What, what does it give us as opposed to feminism? Okay. Well, you may know about the economic rights, the political rights, and the social rights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want me to talk a little bit about those? Okay, so just to do some detail then. So um, let's talk about, to start with economic rights. I'm just going to run through things very quickly. In Islam, um, a woman, um, although she generally um, is, um, the Islamic law gives sort of a setup for women to take on, you know, the traditional role, such as the mother and the wife, but it also gives them the freedom to take up the career roles. So, for example, we have uh, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, her name was Khadija. Uh, uh, may God be pleased with her, she was a businesswoman. Not only that, but uh, the Prophet was employed by her. 
Um, so Islam encourages and it permits and gives you the space to do, um, if you want to pursue careers, you can do that. If you do pursue a career, uh, anything that you earn is your own. Um, nobody has a right over it. If you want to spend it on your family, you can. But the financial obligation in Islam is on the generally on the male. Um, the default position is that the male must provide. Uh, and this is why um, when the inheritance laws are looked at, feminists often say, this is unfair. Why do women only get half of what men get? Um, the rationale behind this is that, say, like a woman gets one half, man gets two halves. The additional half he's given is not just for his own leisure. This is basically like a trust, and the beneficiary is the women. So the women of the family, he has to provide for them. That's what that additional half is for. So it's given to the man, but purely for administrative reasons, because in the eyes of the law, um, he's legally responsible and financially responsible on paper for the women. So that's a little, about, uh, a little bit about the economic side. So much so that, for example, when it is fully implemented, you see that um, if you want to read a little, about, a little bit about this, if you read up about the um, Islamic State of the Ottomans, and I'm not talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago, I'm talking about something that was as recent as 1924. Women were so economically active, um, not only in their own careers, but they would fund, um, they, would call, they were called waqf or awqaf, basically they would fund public institutions, and these public institutions were largely and heavily funded by women. Uh, not only that, but women were very active in, um, in economic and, and the careers, so much so that, um, for example, even in um, just something simple like the rug making industry, uh, women actually had a monopoly. And at one point, men even had to get the government to intervene, like trade unions had to intervene because women were basically operating a monopoly um, in this field. So that's a little bit about economics. Politically, uh, we hear from feminists that women don't have representation in this country. They've never had represent enough representation in parliament. We need 50% quotas here. We need 50% quotas here. More women need to get involved. Why don't we have enough female leaders? In Islam, Islam actually obligates men and women to be politically aware and to be politically involved. If a woman pledges allegiance to um, the leader, which is the equivalent of the vote, but it's very different today. Um, if a woman uh, pledges allegiance, that's the same as a man pledging allegiance to the, to the ruler. Um, if a woman gives protection um, to uh, someone who is considered an enemy of a state, if a woman gives protection to such an individual, the state has to abide by her word and trust that she's made the right decision. Um, so politically, uh, women are, if you want to say empowered, but we don't consider it empowerment. We consider all these things to be a, a duty that we have to administer. Um, Islam takes a different uh, view on the concept of power itself. We don't consider power to be um, a privilege. We don't seek power. We're not allowed to seek power. Power is considered a burden and a responsibility. The more power you have, the more accountable you are. And so in Islam, when the male is given um, responsibility over the female, it's not considered a privilege. It's considered a burden, something that he is accountable for. And thus, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, in one of his final speeches, he said uh, to the men, um, uh, uh, take care of the women or beware of the women. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean watch out for them, they're pretty dodged. No, he was saying um, you have such a big um, a duty or accountability, so beware of that. So this is just a little bit about what Islam provides to women. Obviously, there are longer lectures. Like, you know, we can talk, or we can talk afterwards about more about other aspects, like the social aspects. That's just a brief breakdown because you asked for some material factors, which probably is a good idea. Thank you very much for the question. Okay. The question at the back before you went to the left. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, first of all, uh, uh, it, it was a very nice speech. Um, um, but I actually do agree with uh, some of, uh, some of the like, people who actually asked you like, the same question about feminism. Uh, uh, last year, I actually uh, studied politics, and uh, feminism was one of my favorite uh, topics. And, uh, it is true that there are many different types of feminism, as you said, and so is like Abrahamic religion. Uh, but actually, I, I think you kind of miss the, the, the core value and the core idea of feminism. Feminism is about women finding themselves, like defining themselves, not by uh, like looking themselves, looking at themselves um, at the, like society mainly <clears throat> ruled by men. Uh, or like relationship uh, with with men, um, it's all about like uh, finding them, finding themselves um, like by by themselves. 
So that's the core idea of families, and I, I think you, you said the kind of thing. Um, uh, my question is actually, um, it's about Quran. Um, as a non-religious person, I'm trying to be very objective because I'm very interested in theology and many different religions, but there are some of the Quranic verses which are quite distracting, like for example, I, I have some uh, verses here, for example, like uh, a husband may simply get rid of one of his undesirable wives, or such as husbands may hit their wives even if their husbands merely fear high-handedness in their wives. And as a Muslim woman, how do you interpret these verses? Sure. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order because I think that will work out better. Um, so the, the passage about husbands can apparently hit their wives. I'm going to explain this. Now, the passage doesn't say that husbands, it doesn't, it doesn't advocate domestic violence or uh, beating your wife. It's actually restraining it, and I'm going to explain how. So when the Quran was revealed at the time, and I'd also just like to add that the Prophet, peace be upon him, whose example we emulate in all things, never hit any woman. But at the time, many men were abusive to their wives. They would not only have one wife, they would have tens of wives, and they were very incredibly oppressive and brutal upon them. And so this verse was revealed saying, no, 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 you don't want to be hitting your wife, basically. As if you read the verses, you'll see that it's a three-step program. It's like an anger management program. The first step, oh, is, and also you should notice that the word in the shuls, which says, I think you translated it as high-handedness, um, it's actually been interpreted to actually mean um, basically uh, on the path to um, uh, adultery. So it's meant actually flirtatiousness. So if your wife is flirtatious, this is what you do, basically. And remember that the, the punishment for adultery in Islam for both men and women is capital punishment. So it's talking about if your wife is on the path to, um, to adultery, if she's flirting with other men, here's what you do. And now remember, first of all, and just to begin, um, if the husband is on the path to adultery, what, does, what recourse does the wife have? The, that passage doesn't talk about it, but it's mentioned elsewhere. The wife basically can go directly to the state and the state will publicly um, admonish him and discipline him. This is the recourse that the wife has. For the woman, it's considered um, embarrassing for the husband to drag the woman into a public court and say, my wife's kind of, you know, being a bit like this. No, Islam says you, re you retain her dignity and her respect. This is what you do. It doesn't say you start beating on her. Basically, it's saying, first of all, you talk to her and you explain what's wrong. So if you go, when you open the verses again, have a look, because people often bring up that one verse, but there's one above it and there's one below it. Um, firstly, you speak to your wife and you advise her and you tell her what is wrong with what she's doing if she doesn't realize. Maybe she's not happy in the relationship. Maybe she wants to be with someone else, in which case she can seek a divorce and be with the other person. But if she's just staying in that relationship, but she doesn't want to be with him and she's flirting with someone else, these are the steps that he gets to take. So he first advises her and speaks with her and says, this is wrong and you know, change this thing. Then it says, if that doesn't work, then it doesn't say start you know, oppressing her and you know, force yourself on her and be oppressive and, and mean and brutal to her. No, it says, first you've done that step where you've talked to her and now distance yourself from her. Give her time to think and you think and that space in a marriage is very often very, you know, it resolves things um, most of the time. It says stay, stay away from her bed. It doesn't say stay away from her bed and oppress her. Maybe, like I said, maybe she doesn't want to be with him and then isn't it more oppressive to like be in the same place, you know, as, you know, for yourself and be in the same bed no it's saying take your time and stay away from her so it's also it's limiting that step so whereas previously men would just go straight to beating in that you know in that paradigm and also in today's society we often hear about these domestic violence figures it's equally applicable today um, and then if that doesn't work and again she still has the opportunity to seek a divorce if she's not happy nobody is forcing her to stay if she still doesn't seek a divorce and she's still continuing with that, then it's saying that rather than dragging her to the state and in front of all these things, then you can, you know, whatever. But it's, there's also all these restrictions on, it has to be really, you know, so much, so light that she can't even feel it, basically. It's supposed to be like symbolic. So as you can see, it's not like if you are cross with your wife, you can just start beating on her. No, it's saying these men, you know, are, are pretty, th those particular men, pretty hot-headed. They would just go straight to, you know, very violently beating on their wives. And this passage was basically revealed to say, 
you're not allowed to do that. It's actually designed to restrict it and restrain it. And you have to remember that it's not just, oh, if your wife, you know, she burns something. It's, it's actually if she's on the path to adultery, which has a punishment of capital punishment um, in the eyes of the state. So that's the explanation of that verse. Um, and also, you also asked about a husband may get rid of his wife. That's just talking about divorce, and equally the wife can also divorce a husband. Um, unlike other, I think there's some religions that kind of don't, that ne didn't have the capacity for divorce. Uh, for example, in Britain, until, you know, the early 20th century or maybe the 19th century, you weren't allowed to divorce. Um, you would have to get like a, a law passed to say that your marriage was null rather than divorced. Islam says no, you know, you have that you know, that space, like if you if things are not working out, either the man or the woman can seek divorce. There's a they both have a, a different procedure for doing so, but they're both allowed to seek divorce. So that passage is mentioning many of the laws that regulate um, uh, matters between men and women in Islam. And then finally you said that feminism is just about women defining themselves and that's the core value of feminism. Well unfortunately it's not because if I as a woman want to define myself by wearing my hijab or wearing the niqab or self-segregating at an event. Often, these so-called feminists who you say have their core value as defining themselves, they won't let me define myself in that way. They will say to me, this is wrong, you must be brainwashed, you can't define yourself in that way. So it's a nice aphorism, it's a nice platitude when feminists say we're just about women defining themselves. Not only that is that you know uh, pandering to individualism, which Islam kind of doesn't really um, uh, kind of subscribe to anyway, but it's not even true. So. I hope that answers your questions. Yes. Thank you, Jazakallah uh, sister, for, for your talk. And I think I'm going to take this in a different direction okay. <laughs> and comment on something else that you did address. Okay. Um, fairly recently, there were a series of articles written in The Guardian, one just last week, uh, February the 24th, and the other in November. And it was talking about um, something called lad culture. Yeah. and the effect that this has had on many young women particularly um, pursuing higher education or planning on going to university and I was actually quite mortified by some of the things detailed and chronicled in these articles um, for instance how a lot of British men treat the subject of rape as worthy of levity um, going so far as to suggest that um, for instance, women actually enjoy rape, and a lot of these women find themselves, unfortunately, uh, being groped, if not worse. And I'm wondering when, and, and there doesn't seem to be very much reaction from the state in the way of indignation to this. I'm wondering if perhaps you could react or comment to this, um, particularly in your capacity as someone who does speak on these issues. Um, what have you come across, and does this really undermine the state's ability to say uh, when they are looking at Muslims in Islam that okay you are very oppressive of women but then you have the same politician basically making certain comments in parliament about women who are in parliament so does that undermine the role of the state um, or of, of those in society who on the one hand do call for women's rights but they call for them selectively or they ignore this other side of it if, if you could please react sure and um, it's really interesting the lad culture um if anybody does read about it, it's quite interesting. There's and uh, one particular aspect of it is um, uh, young girls who kind of um, basically want to be more like the lads, and you know there's certain repercussions in this, and it's very interesting. But on particularly with regards to the subject of rape, um, it's a really it's a really difficult subject because it's it's traumatic for many people, and. Um, it's also unfortunate because feminists have often um, talked about rape huge in correctly, it's a huge injustice. Um, however, they've neglected many aspects of it and also, I think, in some ways done damage to um, how society deals with rape. One of the problems, first of all, just to quickly tick it off, is, um, before I, um, is the matter of also male rape. So whilst feminists have talked a lot about um, you know, rape of women, they've ignored the fact that rape, um, for example, in male prisons is absolutely rife and the numbers you know, are frightening and nobody even talks about this. You'd think that feminists who have this kind of you know, emotional um, uh, drive to talk about rape would also think, well, in the name of justice, you know, if feminism really is about justice for all and not just justice for women, they would also bring this up and you know, um, make these claims and you know, advocate for justice for those men too, but we don't hear that. 
And the other unfortunate feature, I think, when feminists talk about rape is having watered it down, watered down the definition to almost beyond a joke. People talk about, you know, how rape jokes are really inappropriate, but I think feminists have made a joke out of rape in some cases. Some feminists have gone so far as to say, if a woman consents before, but then afterwards she said, actually, I didn't, that's considered rape. So what is a guy to do? What is a woman to do? When you've watered down the definition so much, it makes a mockery of those serious cases that, you know, that have, um, you know, that have occurred, those genuine cases that actually need justice. And therefore, you know, when these things are dealt with in the courts, this is why you get this kind of like, we don't know how to, they don't know how to deal with it anymore. Um, in Islam, you know, it takes a different, you know, approach. For example, um, there was a, a story during the time of the, not a story, a, an occurrence during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, a woman said um, that she had been raped. Uh, the Prophet immediately said, he didn't say, a lot of people say that, oh, in Islam you need four witnesses. No, you don't need four witnesses. Um, that's for adultery. Um, and even then, how are you going to get four witnesses to adultery? It's just a, like a contingent to stop people doing it. Like, um, it's just to deter you not to actually, very few people have actually been punished for adultery um, in Islamic history. Um, but for rape, in that particular situation, they didn't need the witness of four people. Her word was enough. And they went and they, they, they went after, they identified the attacker and they, you know, they punished her, they punished the person who did it. Um, Islam takes a different approach, you know, whereas, and it takes it very seriously. I think the problem what we have today is that the definition has been watered down so much that now it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know. And can you blame a legal system that has to be very rigorous and has to be very exacting? How is it going to deal with these problems? And this is why you have these um, insane figures of how few um, rape cases are actually prosecuted. It's not because they're necessarily because the rape hasn't happened, but because the standard of, of, of the, or the definition of rape has now become so wide that people don't know what they're dealing with anymore. So I hope that's a little bit of insight into, into, your, um, into your question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Um, I know the topic's been quite a lot on feminism and stuff. Personally, I don't really that's not really my interest. Um, I just want to draw things back to the title, like women and Islam. Um, you started your talk off talking about misconceptions when it comes to Muslim women. I personally believe cultural traditions have a lot to play when it comes to these misconceptions. Like, for example, you know, I can say, as a Muslim woman, um, Islam actually encourages me to go and seek an education. Someone could rightfully turn around and say to me, why is it that in you know, these Muslim countries, uh, women, it, the percentage of women actually seeking an education is so low. So I want to actually redirect the conversation towards this in terms of what actually is, what is a woman in Islam? Um, speaking specifically on what the Islamic teachings teach of women, their value in Islam, their status in Islam, I want to ask you about that. Okay, I mean, that could also take a whole lecture, but I'll just give a brief rundown. A woman in Islam is the same as a man in Islam. A woman in Islam is simply a servant of God. Um, and predominantly, um, narratives about men and women or instructions to men and women in the Quran are the same for men and women. Because Islam acknowledges that men and women, by and large, are the same. It gives men and women different, um, different instructions or different parameters only in those areas where men and women differ. And that tends to be um, when they come together, as in, like, for example, marriage, or generally when men and women are working together in society, what are those parameters? Generally, in Islam, a woman, just like a man, has the exact same, uh, exact same status. They're considered on par with one another. So Islam says that the, um, the best of you um, is the most righteous of you. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that all people are as equal as the teeth of a comb. Uh, people of all um, uh, colors or races, um, either genders, they're all equal as the teeth of a comb. It's not saying that whatever you do, you're all the same. No, it's saying you all, sorry, I'm gonna keep banging that. It's, it says that, um, basically saying they all start from the same level, and then you are either better than the other or lesser than the other based on how righteous you are. 
And then Islam basically gives um, different um, ways in order to achieve this righteousness. So the Quran says, believing men and women, men and women who give charity, men and women who pray, men and women who help each other. It always says men and women. It doesn't just say men who do this, and women if you do this, you get nothing. It doesn't say that. In fact, it says, God will um, not, um, not let uh, the work of any of you be lost. In other words, if you do good as a woman or a man, your gender is irrelevant. The only thing that is relevant is the good that you do in society. Um, in terms of, uh, there are other things that we can talk about. Um, generally, people like to bring up the status of the of the woman as a mother, um, and uh, um, that the mother, basically, it says in Islam that paradise. Um, lies at the feet of your mother. In other words, serving your mother, looking after your mother, this is a gate to paradise. Similarly, even as a, as a girl, um, you basically are a gate to paradise for your parents because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever has a daughter and does not treat her less than the son or does not, is not oppressive to her and is not you know, um, bad to her will basically you know, have a place in paradise. So even as a, even as a girl, as a child, you know, without even having done anything, you are basically, as a woman, a gate to paradise for your parents. Um, as a mother, you are, you know, you become the gate to paradise for your children. So it gives you all these different, um, for women it gives them these mercies and things like that. And even in terms of worship, um, you know, for example, you know, we, Muslim men and women all fast, we all pray. Uh, for Muslim women, however, um, you get an exemption. Men don't get this exemption. So if it's that time of month or um, after pregnancy or during pregnancy, women don't have to pray. It's not like some people say, oh, is that because Islam thinks women are, you know, dirty or something? No. It's in consideration of women's physiological needs. So it's saying, you know, you don't have to pray. This is a mercy on you, take the mercy. It's the same as when we travel, when Muslim men and women travel, um, our obligations in prayer and fasting are reduced um, and uh, we must reduce those during that time. Similarly, women, you know, our obligations, we are basically exempt from certain acts of worship during certain times. This is in consideration of, of the way that we are. That's just like a little bit into the status of women in Islam. I hope that's some, you know, salient points in there. Um, are there any other specific questions about substantive things in Islam rather than, you know, if you really want to work feminism, you can, but just to maybe give more of an idea to any non-Muslims here about what Islam uh, provides for women, yeah? Um, following up to the culture question, um, we, see, we do see that there's a huge gap between what's happening in reality in different Muslim societies or even countries or even communities and between what the holy book says, the Qur'an says, the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, his own practices even. Do you think that gap has to do with a power relation or let's say um, a, a power of, of who's, who's um, controlling the society in all spheres of life, which is the man? Would you say that this gap between what the Quran says, what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did, which we as Muslims, men and women, believe that it is the, it is the form of justice. We believe that it's in our faith. And between the injustices that happened and that we see, not only today, but centuries before, that happens against Muslim women and children as well. Do you think that's because the power is solely given to the man? I'm not talking about jurisprudence or... Understood, yeah. So just to... I think it's patriarchy. This is exactly. Just to summarize your question, I think the question is, so the Islamic theory says one thing, but Muslim practice says another. Is that because of patriarchy kind of, you know, um, creating some division? Have I understood your question correctly? Uh, yeah, not creating some division, but... Misapplying or being responsible. The people in who, who are responsible, they're the ones who are there. I think, you know, we all know that Islam says one thing, but we don't currently see any Muslim countries implementing this in full. Now, is that the fault of man? Is that the fault of woman? Or is that the fault of us subscribing to the wrong ideologies and supporting those ideologies, in which not only men have a role to play, but women have a role to play as well? In Muslim countries, for example, like I said, they're not Islamic countries, they're secular countries, so we can't even say that there's a gap between the theory that is there and what's being applied, because they're just applying something completely different in the first place. 
But to just blame it on men, I think is pretty sexist. And, you know, um, feminists like to say that they don't blame men for things, but patriarchy itself is basically the blaming of, of men for things. I think it's time to stop blaming and take responsibility, not just men, but women too, take responsibility. In, Muslims, in Muslim countries, the only solution, I mean, we can talk in abstracts and we can talk about, you know, what, you know what's happened in, in the West and things like that. Active solutions. Muslim men and women in Muslim countries must advocate the implementation of Islam in full without any gaps. And that's not, you know, we don't need to waste time playing the blame game and saying it's because of this man or that man or this woman or that woman. Let's just all take responsibility and, you know, work towards that rather than, you know, um, like I said, rather than playing the blame game, we all have a role to play. And we can also work on the symptoms as well. So where, for example, um, women are being abused or children are being neglected by mothers or fathers, we also have to support those organizations which work to alleviate temporarily those problems, whilst we also fix the, the problems at their, at their root. At, you know, on a structural level. And in Muslim countries, that means um, political change, that means economic change, that means social change. It doesn't mean just sticking a band-aid on and saying, well, we have to work from the outside in and, you know, just deal with certain problems at a time. No, there has to be an entire overhaul of those systems. And that's the real problem. The problem is not men or women, it's the ideology that's being subscribed to. Do you have any further questions? Okay. Well, I guess um, thank you very much to Sister Zara, of course, for such a <laughs> insightful talk, which uh, precisely is meant to be creating a platform for discussion, uh, which I guess we have done today, and hopefully this allows more room for discussion in the coming future. Uh, we will on end on this note.